Good evening students. Hope you all are doing good and hope your preparation is going fine. Welcome again to the analyst. This is 19th of July 2023 and we are going to discuss important articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express. Now the handouts are there in the description box. You can use those handouts to streamline your current affairs preparation. Now let us jump to the table of contents. That what all important topics we are going to discuss today. See the first topic is India's great power relations. That is India's relation with the great powers of the whole world. Second is India's foreign trade and specially focus on export and import of the previous year. That is the year of 2022 to 2023. Then socio-economic caste census, again a very important social issue for us. Then trading in local currencies. That is the overall issue of the internationalization of rupee that we'll be discussing in detail. Then genetically modified crops, that is GM crops, which you call them GM crops as well, we'll be studying genetically modified crops as well. So coming to the first topic of today, there has been an editorial in the newspaper by C. Raja Mohan in relation to Delhi rising its game. Now, how this editorial has faced out is that it has detail by detail listed that how India is growing towards a more multipolar world and how India has been contributing for the creation of a multipolar world where there is no one superpower but variety of powers engaging among themselves. Right. So why this is important for us? For our general studies paper 2 where international relations is mentioned from the perspective of India and its neighborhood relations and the effect of policies of developed and developing countries, this becomes important for us. Now let us understand the whole geopolitical scenario and the global power relations and the great power relations which India is having and how it is gaining a new momentum. So if we talk about the recent developments, we all know that our Prime Minister visited USA recently. He also visited France and also UAE. Now, in, uh, in the visit of all these countries, there are several agreements which have been signed, several partnerships which has been made. India and France celebrated 25 years of strategic partnership. India and USA had a drone deal. India and UAE had a currency agreement as well, whereby they'll be doing trade in the local currencies. Right. So in relation to that, PM visit to all these countries can be deemed as very, very successful. Now, our external affairs minister, that is S.J. Shankar also, he visited Jakarta and Bangkok. And there he had to participate in several of the meetings, which basically included our extended neighborhood, which basically included our ASEAN, ASEAN meetings as well, which included ASEAN plus meetings as well, which included East Asia Summit as well, which included ASEAN Regional Forum as well, which also included Mekong Ganga Cooperation Meeting and which also included your BIMSTEC meeting. So in all these meetings, our external affairs minister S.J. Shankar joined when he was there in Jakarta and Bangkok. And our external affairs minister attending all these meetings basically signifies what? It signifies that India has been putting our neighborhood, our extended neighborhood, that is the ASEAN countries, Southeast Asia, very, very closely in our overall dynamics of foreign policy. And if you see very closely, you will see that while we are maintaining a very solid and good relationship with our extended neighborhood, on the other hand, we are also strengthening our partnership with the global powers, which includes your US, France and UAE, right? So how India is doing so? Let us see in detail. See, first of all, India also signed Indo-Pacific Roadmap for Wide-Ranging Cooperation with France, which again puts into force the commitment of India and France to collaborate on the issue of Indo-Pacific. Because Indo-Pacific as a region is very, very important for the interests of India from strategic purposes and from maritime security purposes as well. Now, strategic partnership with the USA. Now, India is having a very, very deep rooted and strategic partnership with the US. How? First of all, we are majorly collaborating in the Indo-Pacific region. 
if we talk about maritime security, if we talk about military exercises, if we talk about groupings, which includes basically your quad and one more grouping that is your I2U2. So in all these groupings, India and US has been closely collaborating. Plus India's relationship with France and India's relationship with the US in the matters of defense are very, very deep, right? So in relation to that as well, we have been creating a strategic partnership with both US and France. Now the business which we are doing currently, that is we are focusing on our neighborhood as well. And simultaneously, we are focusing on the global powers as well. And we are letting the global powers to join the neighborhood policy of ours because we are inviting France to become our partner in the Indo-Pacific region. So you have to see one thing here that earlier India used to be wary of these powers. For example, France was a colonial power. So these powers to enter into the Indian Ocean region or to have substantial interest in the Indo-Pacific region, India used to be wary of that. But currently the scheme is, the overall global schematic is that India is pushing forward the agenda of these countries collaborating with India to develop a security related dynamic around the Indo-Pacific region, which states, which tells us what? That there has been a changed matter. There has been a changed outlook towards the foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis India after the Cold War. Now, after Cold War, what happened since India liberalized as well, the 1991 LPG reforms happened. After that, India started to have a more outward policy. That is, India started inviting other countries to put FDI into our country. After that, the bilateral relationship with other countries also had a very steady progress. So because of that, after the Cold War, the matters got changed and the business which is happening now, it is not a usual business. That is, it is not what India was earlier doing, but it is something different which India is experimenting and innovating. Now, India is on a quest of a multipolar world. So we can say that India is on a multipolar quest. How? Because after the Cold War, you would see that earlier, uh, after the Cold War, India basically joined a forum or became a part of the forum, which you now call as BRICS. That is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. The major developing countries across the whole world, plus the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Again, a very important organization with respect to India. And if we talk about economy and security aspect as well. So India is now focusing on a multipolar quest. But we are having our own problems with China. First and the foremost problem is China threatening our border security and China threatening sovereignty and integrity of our country. Now, because of that, we have to join various multilateral forums, which includes our Quad and I2U2. And we have to align with the US with Australia, with Japan, with France, in order to contain the influence of China in the region, right? Because you know that after the end of the Cold War, two things happened. USSR got disintegrated and USA had a unilateral power. That is, USA was having a hegemony in the world politics. So USA was having a hegemonistic tendency and it rooted itself against it and USA formed a basically unipolar world during that period of time because USA was the single most largest power after the 1991. But after the 2008 crisis, after the 2008 global financial crisis or after the twin tower attack which happened on US, the hegemony of US basically started to erode a bit. So when that hegemony started to erode, there was one power which was increasing steadily. And that power was China. And now the time is such that is in the year 2023, China is looking eye to eye 
in front of US and China is directly challenging the hegemony of United States. So currently two things are happening. US is trying to protect its hegemony and China is directly challenging the hegemony of US in the global politics in the global world. So from the interest of US, the US also wants to contain China. From our interest, because China is our neighbor, China is a nuclear power, because of Chinese alignment with Pakistan, and because China is threatening our sovereignty and integrity, threatening our borders, we have to naturally align with USA. I hope you understand this. But it does not mean that we have stopped aligning with Russia. Even though Russia and China are friends, but still we are maintaining a very good, very amicable and a very sound relationship with Russia. So which means what? That India is having a balancing act and the great power relations of India with the entire world, with the great powers in the world has gained a new momentum. Because India has now managed to maintain good relation with all the economic and military powers in the world, except China, obviously. But we have also managed to maintain good relationship with our neighborhood plus the extended neighborhood as well. So what is the way forward? See, way forward is that we need to have an integrated view of interest. Our interest cannot be very, very, uh, like for example, our interest cannot be very, very narrow. Our interest cannot be in a manner or in a way that we only think of a parochial view. We need to think in the wider context as well. Because the 21st century is the Asian century, right? Because of that, India has to play a major role in the global politics. So our interest should not be parochial. Our interest should be global. Our interest should be wider and our interest should be sound which is why integrated view of interest becomes important. Plus, we need to shape our intersection between our extended neighborhood and the global powers in the world. So we need to shape our interactions, our intersections, that how we interact with them, how our intersection is between the extended neighborhood of ours and between the global powers. I hope you got the point of this article, you got the point of what I was trying to explain about the India's great power relations, which has gained a new momentum. Now coming to the second topic of today, it is related to India's foreign trade. Plus we will be dis discussing about the export and import data as well. Now why this is important? Because our GS paper 3, Indian economy is clearly mentioned and issues relating to planning mobilization of resources, growth development and employment is mentioned. So this export, import and foreign trade is directly a part of Indian economy, which is why it becomes important. Now first of all, you have to know that foreign trade of India includes what? It includes export import of goods. It also includes export import of services. Now what happens is that whenever we are exporting or importing a particular good or let's say merchandise, we categorize it into the term as visibles, right? So goods are considered as visibles because they are tangibles. We can see them. We can basically touch them. But services, on the other hand, they are coming under invisibles. Invisibles means what? That we can experience the services, we can feel the services, but we can't touch it. For example, I am giving you a lecture. You can't touch the lecture, but you can experience the lecture. So what kind of service is this? This is the educational service or the teaching service. Right? So export import of services is also part of our foreign trade. Now, what is the current data and what current data says? See, first of all, related to the merchandise exports, that how many merchandise or how many goods we exported, uh, what is the worth of the goods we exported in the year 2022 to 2023? This is the date of economic survey. So close to $447 billion worth of goods we exported. And how much we imported? We imported 
क्लोज टू सेवन हंड्रेड फिफ्टीन बिलियन डॉलर वर्थ ऑफ गुड्स विच शोज दैट वी आर हैविंग अ डेफिसिट इन द मर्चेंडाइज ट्रेड सो इन मर्चेंडाइज ट्रेड वी आर हैविंग अ डेफिसिट क्लोज टू टू फिफ्टी टू थ्री हंड्रेड बिलियन डॉलर कमिंग टू द सर्विस एक्सपोर्ट्स नाउ सर्विसेज में यू विल सी अ ट्रेंड दैट वी आर हैविंग थ्री ट्वेंटी टू बिलियन डॉलर आर एक्सपोर्ट्स and imports are 178 billion dollars which means exports are more than imports and there is a surplus in our service trade and overall if we see this import export of goods export import of services it is a part of which account and balance of payment it is a part of current account and if you see the deficit which is there in the merchandise trade that deficit is a part of our current account deficit and this is a major reason that why current account deficit in our country remains a problem right now what are the major export items for us the what are the items we export the most first of all ma machinery transport and metals then mineral fuels and lubricants then agriculture allied products chemicals allied products gems and jewelries and we export all these products to first of all our major export destination is united states of america and at the second number it is uae at the third number it's netherlands then it is china and then it is bangladesh now coming to the major import items that the items we import the most first obviously the petroleum items that is petroleum and oil lubricants then the capital goods then non ferrous minerals chemical elements pearls precious and semi precious stones now we all know that we import most of the products because most of the products you see in our household as well if you see in the market as well they are made in china so obviously it should be a no brainer that the major import source for us at the first number it is obviously the china at second number it is uae third it is us then it is saudi arabia and at the fifth number it is russia so this is about the export import its destinations its sources and what are the products and what has been the data in the last year now what we need to understand is that why our exports are not able to grow as much as it should because we saw that exports of goods were less than imports of goods so where the problem is that why we are not able to grow our exports and why do we have to import a lot of goods from china what is the reason see first of all we need to know the challenges faced in our export sector or in our foreign trade sector first obviously is infrastructural deficiency we are having limited ports we are having limited railway lines across the ports we are having limited docks we are having limited shipping yards because of the infrastructural deficiencies in the major coastal areas of our country and in the major uh, economic areas of our country because of infrastructural deficiency we are not able to export as much as we should so this is the first reason then complex regulatory environment now because of red tapeism because of file moving from one desk to other desk to other desk from one person to the other person because of that and the regulatory environment that that is you have to take a form from this place you have to submit it to the other place then you have to submit another form then you have to submit some other form another compliance so multiplicity of compliance and complex regulatory environment is one of the reason also the trade barriers and the tariffs because of that as well uh, many countries which includes your usa they are having trade barriers with a west trade with india various other countries european union they are also imposing tariff on our products because of that we are not able to export large amount of products then limited export or diversification now we saw that there are limited items only which we are able to export because we are not having competitiveness in all those sectors and absolute advantage and competitive advantage that is the comparative advantage is missing in our exports so limited export diversification is also one of the reason inadequate trade finance 
Now the financial facilities are provided by the banks. There is export import bank as well. That is Exim Bank. But still, it is not that robust. The trade finance which needs to be provided to the citizen of our country because there are the population of India is very huge. So once you take that into account and the proportion of the trade finance provided, it seems very, very minuscule. Because of that, it is also one of the challenge. Now, what are the various initiatives to enhance the trade? See, obviously, the first initiative is that the government has introduced SWIFT system on the customs portal. Now, what the SWIFT system means, it is a single window interface to facilitate your trade. Now, this complex regulatory environment we heard. Now, in order to solve this problem, government has introduced this SWIFT system in the customs portal. Also, this Turant customs have been introduced. That is 24 into 7 custom clearance facility has been introduced by the government. Plus the rod tip scheme. That is a remission of duties, taxes on exported products scheme. Plus export credit guarantee cooperation. This export credit guarantee cooperation, it provides guarantee to our exporters. Also, it provides export credit insurance to our exporters as well. So this is also aiding in increase on exports of our products. Then district as export hubs. Now one district, one product initiative you all know. So creating one district for one product so that specialization is there. So that comparative advantage, competitive advantage is there in that district. Because of that, our exports will rise because the prices will lower down and the labor cost will also be less. So because of that, eventually creating district as a hub to improve our exports. I hope this initiative is clear. Then the foreign trade policy of 2023, the most important trade policy if you talk about the current context. So you have to prepare it well for your examination as well because this is absolutely important. In this foreign trade policy also, there are several sub schemes and several sub initiatives which the government is aiming to do and has been doing in order to increase our foreign trade. And not just in one aspect, but from various aspects, for example, handloom sector, artifact sector, right? So in all these neglected sectors as well, government has been trying to improve the foreign trade, that is to produce those products more and more and export it to different countries. Your production linked incentive scheme is also there. Uh, let me write it down. Production linked incentive scheme is also there. That is also one of the initiatives to improve our exports. So all these initiatives have been taken by the government in order to enhance our trade. But one thing which we need to keep in mind is that having schemes is one issue or one thing. But implementing those schemes so that the results are achieved in a better manner so that the solution is amicably achieved. That is a very, very difficult task. So continuous monitoring, the participation of all the stakeholders and continuous upliftment of the exporters and the population of our country is highly important in order to ensure that the implementation of these schemes happen very judiciously, effectively and efficiently. I hope this is very clear to all of you. Now coming to the another topic which is related to the caste census. Now recently opposition party meeting happened. Now in that there was a call for uh, conducting the caste census. So socio-economic caste census from this becomes important for us because earlier also there have been several debates surrounding the socio-economic caste census and it has basically been in news since the last many years. So it has in a way become a contemporary issue of yours. So it is important for us to study that. Now for our GS paper 2, issues relating to development, this caste census becomes important and also for the management of our social sector as well. Now in GS paper 1 as well, social issues, population and related issues have been mentioned. Also poverty and developmental issues have been mentioned, which is why socio-economic caste census is directly important from our syllabus perspective as well. Right now, first of all, we need to understand that what is a census before understanding socioeconomic caste census. Census is an exercise where enumeration of a population and its characteristics takes place. 
Now, what does enumeration of population mean? Enumeration of population means that we are knowing the characteristics of our population, that what is the number of people living in a household, what is the age, what is the gender, what is the sexual orientation, what is the background, all, what is the caste, what is the economic status, all those things, if we are taking into account of individuals in a country, that is the population of a country, we are doing an exercise which you call as census. Now, especially we are focusing on socio-economic data, that is poverty-related data, development-related data, and caste data, then that particular census is called as socio-economic caste census. Right. So first census, normal census in India happened in the year 1881, as we all know. And first socio-economic caste census happened in the year 1931. Now it had two parameters and the current caste census is also having two parameters. First is the economic status of a person to know the socio-economic deprivation. Then the caste status of that person, that what is the caste of that particular individual. This entails our socio-economic caste census. Now, what are the ministries involved under it? See, first is your Ministry of Rural Development. That is there. It basically implemented or it basically conducted the 2011 caste census, socio-economic caste census. There is another ministry that is Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. It is responsible for the urban areas, enumeration in urban areas. Then Ministry of Home Affairs under that, Registrar General and Census Commissioner of India responsible for the caste census, right? So these all ministries are conducting the caste census, socioeconomic caste census and responsible for its conduction. This 2011 socioeconomic caste census was conducted by Ministry of Rural Development. And it was the first caste census which took both rural and urban areas as a whole. And the results were partially published in the year 2015. And the caste related results are not yet published. So there is an automatic exclusion and inclusion criteria as well. That if we, there are some parameters in your household, for example, if you're having a mobile phone or if some person in your family is having a government job or if you're having a vehicle. So all those criteria, if you are meeting, that means you are automatically excluded from the socioeconomic deprived criteria, right? But for example, if you're not having a roof on your head, right or if you are a destitute if all those if you are a, a like vulnerable tribal if all those criterias are there then you are automatically included in this socio-economic deprivation criteria so there are various indicators and criterias for automatic inclusion and exclusion of people under this census right now some data related to the socio-economic census of 2011 if you want to see it is there in front of your screen as well like 8.69 crore were considered poor and deprived in the rural areas then 2.37 crore households were with single kacha room. Then 5.37 crore people were landless households. Were the 5.37 crore households were the landless households. Uh, people were the land uh, having landless households. Then 2.50 crore households with one salaried member. So all these data you can study for yourself and you can see where you can fit in and use these data. Now coming to the need and importance. Now what is the need and importance for the conducting this socioeconomic caste census? See first important need is that identification of deprived and vulnerable sections. We all know that Indian society is divided into caste and in order to know that what caste group or what social group or what section in the Indian society is vulnerable and is deprived, the socio-economic caste census becomes very, very important. So this is one of the reasons. Plus, if we know that how many people are backward, how many people are socially and economically poor, we will be able to target the welfare programs in a better way. So better targeting of welfare programs because of the socio-economic caste census, then in order to address the issues of our local governance, this can be helpful. 
for policy formulation because we would be knowing that how many deprived people are in which area and what they are deprived of and what they need. So in all these cases, policy formulation will be aided then addressing the issues of poverty and inequality. Because until and unless we are not knowing who is poor, how will we address the problem of inequality and poverty? Then in order to ensure inclusive development, this socioeconomic caste census becomes imperative and important. Now, what are the concerns and challenges surrounding the socioeconomic caste census? See, first concern is that it is a emotive element. See, caste in our society and caste in our country is a very, very emotive element. That is, it is an emotional issue because many traumatic incidents in the past history has happened in relation to caste. So for some people, caste becomes a very, very touchy and a very, very emotional subject, which is why if we ask every person about their caste, some people might not be comfortable with telling their caste. So, because for some people it is an emotional issue, so conducting this caste census becomes a challenge. Plus, the data is still unreleased. The census which happened in the year 2011, uh, the partial data has been released, but the caste data has still not been released. So, this is also one of the challenge. Then, caste and class are different. See, we need to understand that caste is a hierarchy which is created in the Indian society because of the Varna system. But class is basically an economic criteria that is division of people in various classes that is haves and have nots and based on economic criteria. So we shall not combine caste and class together. That is the opinion of several scholars, right? Then some scholars are saying that some statisticians are also saying that this data is highly unreliable that the socioeconomic caste data is unreliable and there are several errors in it there are several omissions which need to be made and quality issues are there with the data right and also your ministry of rural development is conducting this and several scholars are having apprehensions in that as well that why not your registrar general or census commissioner or nso is conducting this exercise so this is also one more issue then sensitivity and privacy now because it is a emotive issue as well there is certain sensitivity which is associated with caste data with caste of a particular individual and the issue of privacy is there as well that how can we know or how can we make public that what is the caste group, what is the number of people, all those things, right? So privacy issue is also there. Then hardening caste status. Now, some people would be saying that we wanted to eliminate caste system from our country. And that is the view of several scholars as well. But by doing this exercise, we are strengthening and hardening the caste status of the people. That is, we are labeling people with their caste. So, for some scholars, it is a wrong exercise. Now, the last and the most important challenge is the caste-based politics. Now, you must have heard about casteization of politics and politicization of your caste. So, in these issues, if the caste is politicized and it is made a matter of political debate, then political parties would be in a race to get votes based on this emotive issue. And ultimately, who will be the sufferer? The common people, the common public. Which is why, again, according to some scholars, we must not go in an emotive way and we must not have this caste census, according to some scholars. Now, what is the way forward? See, first of all, as a very progressive society, we need to understand that a careful and reliable conduct of socioeconomic caste census is imperative because until and unless we are not having the data, how will we be able to formulate the policies which are targeting those groups or targeting those sections? So first thing is that we enumerate that who is deprived and second thing is then we initiate various policies and schemes in order to help those people who are deprived. Right. So if first step is not there, how can the second and third step will be effective? Right. So according to many scholars and according to the neutral perspective as well, the socioeconomic caste census should be conducted, but it should be conducted carefully in a reliable manner because it is imperative for our society. Now, coming to the next topic, internationalization of rupee. Now, India and UAE has basically had a deal to trade with Indian rupees. Now, in relation to that, the topic of 
internationalization of rupee becomes very very important now with perspective of your gs paper 3 indian economy and issues relating to it this uh, topic internationalization of rupee becomes very very important now first of all we need to understand what is the meaning of this that what is internationalization of rupee internationalization of rupee means the process of making indian rupee a globally accepted currency so if indian rupee is becoming globally accepted the transactions internationally are happening in the form of indian rupee then rupee can be termed as a international currency and that process in itself is called as internationalization of rupee right now your question would be that what is the need of this internationalization why do we need to internationalize rupee see first reason is that there is hegemony of the dollar in the foreign market so because of hegemony and over dependence on us dollars we need to reduce that level of dependence which is why we need to promote our currency as well which is why internationalization of rupee becomes important then second reason is that since dollar is a reserve currency and it is a international currency us there would be very less likelihood that us would be facing a balance of payment crisis and the foreign exchange problems because us can print more and more dollars and then pay back their loans because us dollar is internationally accepted but this can't be the case with india which is why india wants its currency to become international so that it does not face the bop crisis or the various foreign exchange crisis which are there right so this is the second reason now coming to the various steps which are taken by the government of india in order to internationalize the rupee see first step is that we had liberalized our capital account so liberalization of capital account is one thing because there is full cap uh, current account convertibility but capital account is still not fully convertible but still we have liberalized the capital account transactions that is the transactions related to fdi fii so we have liberalized it to some extent and convertibility of rupee in this has been there partially right because of this a uh, rupee will become a international currency then promotion of offshore rupee markets that is we are promoting offshore rupee markets where rupee can be traded so offshore that is in the other countries there will be proper markets where rupee will be exchanged for their currencies so offshore rupee markets are being promoted by the government plus your currency swap agreements see currency swap agreements happens between the rbi and the central bank of the other country in that currency swap we basically swap a certain proportion of our currency with the other countries which basically changes our foreign exchange balances as well right so in relation to that this is also helping in internationalization of rupee then promotion of your rupee denominated masala bonds okay so rupee denominated masala bonds means what for example indian company if they want to raise money they can issue masala bonds in the foreign territory but in the denomination of rupee so foreigners need to buy rupee first and after that they can buy those bonds so for, but first of all they need to buy the rupees after that they can buy the bonds and ultimately rupee will become a international currency so that is also one of the major which government of india is taking and then the last is your bilateral trade agreements so bilateral trade agreements which you saw india are doing with the uae because of these bilateral agreements for example india and uae they decided that they will be trading in indian rupee and like this we are having various bilateral agreements with other countries as well because of this rupee will become a international currency in the near future 
So all these measures are there which will help Indian rupee to be internationalized. But what are the various pros and cons for internationalization of a currency or adopting rupee trade settlement uh, in the international trading? See, first is the pro. Let us talk about the pro. First of all, it will enable trade with the dollar scarce economies. That is the economies which are not having dollar. Second is it will save dollar payments on imports. Third is it will reduce the role of reserves as our import cover. We will not be having the requirement to keep a lot of reserves. Last is we will get protection from exchange rate fluctuations, which you already saw in the need of implementation. Right. What can be the cons? First is unlikely to be accepted by some major trading partners. For example, China is a major trading partner. Now, China would be promoting their own currency. Why would they be promoting Indian rupee? So they would not be accepting this mode of payment. Then USA also, because we are directly competing with the hegemony of dollar. So that is also one of the con. Then forego dollar receipts on exports. Now, we have to maintain our foreign exchange reserves to major extent in the form of dollars. But we have to forego the dollar receipts and we will have to take payment in Indian rupee, right? Then also we will lose the reserve accretion from the export dollars. That is also one of the con. Then potentially higher non-resident ownership of Indian assets. Because if Indian rupee are sent abroad, maybe higher proportion of non-resident ownership will be there. That is people who are not residing in our country, but having currency of India with them. So that can also be a con. Now, once we have understood this, let us move to the last topic of today. It is related to your genetically modified crops. Now, why this is in news? Because an editorial has come which basically talks about our GM mustard and the controversy surrounding GM mustard. Now, GM mustard have been partially approved by your genetically engineering appraisal committee and various environmentalists and various botanists, they have put a case in the Supreme Court, uh, this uh, basically challenging this uh, judgment or challenging this act by the GAC and also challenging this genetically modified mustard developed by the Delhi University, right? So in relation to that, we will study GM crops in very much detail. Now, why it is important? Again, for our GS paper 3, science and technology perspective, this GM, a genetically modified crop, becomes important. Now, first thing is that we need to understand what are GM crops. See, GM crops, or as you call them as transgenic crops, they are the crops which the plants are, they are the crops under which there is some genetically modified component. So the crops or the plants that has been modified, the core of the plants have been modified through genetically engineering techniques, through genetically engineering techniques. If the core of the plants or the core of the crops are modified to enhance its characteristics, to change its characteristics, those particular crops can be called as genetically modified crops. That is the genes of those crops have been modified. Some might be added, some genetic component might be added or some genetic component might be altered in those crops. So once we have understood that, let us see the GM crops in India. See, first of all, we have to see in India, there is a committee which you call as Genetic Engineering Appraisal Committee. This is the committee which is a statutory body under your Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now, this particular committee under the provision of Environmental Protection Act is the apex body which allows the genetically modified crops to be in our country. And currently in the year 2002, this GAC has allowed BT cotton as a crop to be grown. BT cotton is a genetically modified version of the cotton, right? So uh, about genetically engineering appraisal committee. Now if we talk about the legal provisions. See, first thing is that this genetically engineering appraisal committee is having the authority to reject or to accept the applications in relation to GM crops. Now, once we have understood that, what are the various regulations or various acts 
under which we are able to regulate these crops. See, first is the Environment Protection Act, which we already saw because this GEAC is under this Environment Protection Act. Then there is your FSSA as well. That is your Food Safety and Standards Authority of India. And under the Food Safety and Standards Act of 2006. So this is also one of the act which basically affects our genetically modified uh, crops. Then your Biological Diversity Act of 2002. This is also act which regulates GM crops. Then your Plant Quarantine Order of your 2003. This is also one of the thing. Also Drugs and Cosmetic Rules. That is Drugs and Cosmetic Rules of 1988. This is also one of the rules which basically regulates our GM crops. Now this GEAC which is there, this body, this body of GEAC which is there, it was earlier called genetically engineering, genetic engineering appraisal, not appraisal but approval committee. But after that it name got changed and now it is called genetically engineering, genetic engineering appraisal committee. Now, what are its major functions? See, functions overall we all know, but what are its various functions? First of all, it is responsible for appraisal of activities which involve large scale use of hazardous microorganisms or hazardous materials. So hazardous microorganisms are being used. The appraisal of those acts will be done by this GEAC. Plus they will also have a check on the import and export of your genetically modified organisms or genetically modified crops. And it is also responsible for appraisal of proposals related to release of genetically modified organisms into the uh, into the overall environment and to the release of genetically modified crops also into the overall environment. So this is also one of the basic function which GEAC has. So if we talk about the GM crops in India, there is one crop which is there that is your BT cotton which is allowed to be freely uh, planted or which is allowed to be freely sown in the country. And because of this allowment in the year 2002, currently 90% of the cotton crops you see is the genetically modified version of the cotton crop. right? And there is one more thing that use of unapproved, unapproved genetically modified variant right it will attract a jail term of five years and also a fine of one lakh rupees under your environment protection act so under environment protection act because this geac is made under this uh, environment protection act so this uh, punishment is also there if we use the unapproved gm variant that is which is not approved by the geac now i hope you understood all about your genetically modified crops and also something about the geac that is genetic engineering appraisal committee Thank you for watching this lecture. That's it for today. Uh, hope you prepare well and all the very best for your preparation. Good luck.